Bibles and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 19. We'll just use this one verse and jump into a few others. <clears throat> We're making our way through the Ten Commandments and uh, we are on Commandment 8. So verse 19 is where we'll be uh, tonight. Give you a second to get there. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 19 says, Neither shalt thou steal. Neither shalt thou steal. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you so much that, <clears throat> Lord, you love us and you're good to us. You're better than what uh, we deserve, Lord, by far. And, Father, we're thankful for your patience with us. But I pray, Lord, as we look here at this message tonight, uh, so often we think, uh, about stealing is just about possession. But Lord, there's other things that uh, the Word of God ties into this and help us, Lord, to uh, use the principles that you have given to us that we might uh, be able to live the Christian life and live it in such a way that we can please you. And, and Father, we just want you to receive the glory and honor for all things that we do and pray that you'll use us to help bring other people to Jesus. And Father, we ask and pray all this now pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, when we think about stealing, obviously anytime we take what doesn't belong to us, that's stealing. But when we keep from someone what we owe them, in other words, we don't give them what is rightfully theirs, we have also stolen. Uh, there are many things that we can steal. We can steal time. We can steal money. We can steal affection, possessions. You can even steal love. And the Bible talks about defrauding. There's a word that we use throughout the New Testament. It's the word defraud. I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When we defraud someone else, we again take what doesn't belong to us. So that's what stealing is. You're defrauding somebody. And in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth, and he's rebuking this church about many things that they are doing wrong. And this is one thing in particular that he is addressing here because uh, they obviously were doing this wrong as well. They were free in their relationships uh, with one another, more so than what they ought to have been. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, Now concerning the things where he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. And you'll notice a period after that. What does it mean, not to touch a woman? This is talking about, obviously, in an inappropriate way. Uh, it's what, you know, you get a guy and girl before they get married, and, and they are... Uh, it always starts off very innocently, very casually. You might be a little hug or a little pat on the shoulder. But it always leads to something else. The Bible says here very specifically, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless, to avoid what? Fornication. That's where some of these relationships will lead to. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. And then verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, what, how does all this tie together with defrauding? Well, first of all, young people, this part here is for you. If you are not married yet, you better realize that uh, that person that you're kissing, you may be kissing somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. You might be kissing somebody else's spouse. You might be having affection towards them. And God says, that's defrauding. That's, that's a no-no. You know, this isn't a practice. This isn't, isn't about playing games. Uh, some people say, oh, you know, preacher, that's just a little too strict. No, it's not too strict. Right. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. Now, I think you can right. figure that out if you're an adult and a teenager. You can figure out what that means. So, But it says here, defraud ye not one another except it be with consent for time. 
That means if you're a husband and wife, and uh, you might be going into a time of prayer or a time of fasting, uh, and basically, as a husband and wife, your body is not your own. You have no right to withhold affection from the other person. Now, affection is different for a man and woman. You know, Becky, when she uh, <clears throat> is needing affection from me, it is different than what I would need from her. Her affection would be just, you know, giving her a hug or a foot massage or something like that. That would be my affection for her. She's a touch. So that would be just something that's very casual type touching. And that relieves the pressure and stress. But if I get mad at her and I get upset with her and I withhold that affection, I am defrauding her. I am stealing is what the Bible's teaching here. Now, couples do this all the time. They get upset with one another. And uh, the, the Bible talks, too, about not letting the sun go down upon your wrath and how we need to deal uh, you know, when we're angry with somebody and how we need to work through that and all of that. But defrauding is very, very serious. There's a lot of problems that come from it. Matter of fact, over turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, because this is the main verse I want to use when we think about stealing. God gives us some principles in his word to help us live the Christian life the way he wants us to live it. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28 is a good verse because it actually deals with stealing. It deals with defrauding in any way, shape, or form. And there's actually three things we find here, and this is going to be just the three points of the message, uh, very simply. It says here in verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more. Neither shalt thou steal, is what the Bible says, what we read there in Deuteronomy. But let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needed. So Ephesians 4.28 explains this commandment, and it explains what we need to be teaching to our children as we're teaching them about the Ten Commandments. We're teaching Sunday school classes, or we're teaching uh, anybody. We need to teach them what these principles are, and these three principles that we need to teach and instruct them are very simple. It's honesty, it is work, and it's about giving. Those three things are very important when it comes to this principle. So first of all, let's look here at honesty. There are many, many, many forms of stealing. Let me just give you a few of them here. We'll look at a few verses. Uh, one form of stealing, and this is just direct stealing. Shoplifting, armed robbery, burglary, workplace theft. That's all forms of stealing. That's direct stealing. You have fraud. Fraud is when you use deceit or concealment to obtain money or avoid losing it by gaining an advantage. In other words, you sell a car. You sell your car and you don't tell the person all the problems with the car that you've had. That's fraud. You're stealing. I have a hard time sometimes stealing. As a matter of fact, that white car we had out here for a while... It was out there for a while because I had a hard time stealing. I had a hard time stealing. <laughs> I did have a hard time stealing. I had a hard time selling it because I just told people everything that happened, everything I knew about the car. And they were just kind of like, well, I don't think I'm interested. My goal was not to sell the car. I wanted to be honest with whoever got the car. And so that's what we need to do is be honest. We're not trying to get an advantage. We're not this is not, you know, even in a business transaction. Uh, you give an honest day's wage for honest labor. That's what you do. Uh, you're not trying to manipulate. There's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong if you bought a car. I had somebody ask me this question one time. Say they bought the car for, I think it was uh, $1,000 or whatever it was, and they turned around and sold it for 2000 Not a thing wrong with that. But it's when you're trying to sell it for $2,000 and it is in horrible condition and you're trying to pretend it's not then there's a problem. That's when you're stealing. That's when you are stealing by fraud. Uh, here's another way we can steal. Turn, if you would, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Colossians, chapter 3. And I could spend a lot more time on each one of these things, but I'm not going to. I just want to go through them quickly here about being honest. Colossians, chapter 3. Look at verse 22. Here's the way most people steal, and these are people we'd say are good people. These are people who are in church. These are, this is the way they steal from their employers. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. What's that saying? That's saying 
You don't give half-hearted work at your job. Why? Because you're stealing from them. I had somebody uh, one time in my past say uh, they were actually, they were given a job to paint. It was a, a huge, huge thing. Well, they could have done it with a roller. They actually got a two-inch brush and painted the whole entire thing with a two-inch brush. And somebody that was working with them says, why are, why are we painting this with two-inch brushes? And here was the answer. Because we're getting paid by the hour. That's stealing. We have to be careful. Half-hearted work is stealing. Uh, here's another way people steal. Employers by not paying a fair wage. In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Give them what is right. Give them a fair day's wage. Here's another way people steal. Uh, tax evasion. Now, let me say this about taxes. There's not a thing wrong if there's a loophole for you to jump through it. You know, if it's in there, it's legal, it's for you to do it. But when you are purposely evading taxes, you're not reporting all your income, or you're not doing this, or you're not doing that, that's stealing. Because Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's. We have to be careful. Here's another way people steal. Insurance manipulation. We try to manipulate insurance companies. Now, I know insurance companies, uh, for the most part, they're a ripoff in a lot of ways. Uh, they have to pay all this money that they don't want to pay back anything. That happens. But when we try to just get a fraudulent claim against insurance, it's stealing. God does not uh, look at that in a, in a favorable light. Another way people steal is through gambling. Now, for every, here's the thing with gambling. For every winner, there must be a loser. That's the thing with gambling. Now, you get the lottery. Think of how many losers there are to make one winner. There's a bunch of them. That's gambling. It is profit and pleasure at someone else's pain and loss. That's how you can tell it's gambling. Here's another way. Uh, now, let me say this about, some people say, well, what about legitimate business? Well, that's not gambling. That's a win-win. You can invest in a, in a company, invest in that. You're winning. The company's winning. People are benefiting from that. We call that capitalism. It's different. It's not the same thing as gambling. Here's another way people steal. Withholding love and affection. I touched on this one uh, earlier, just briefly, but Romans chapter 13 and verse 8, you don't have to turn back here. I'm just going to read it. It says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. In other words, don't owe, don't steal from him, but love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Spouses can defraud of physical love. They can withhold that physical love. They should not do that. Children can defraud parents of honor. They don't give their parents honor like they're supposed to. We can defraud our neighbor by not loving them. We're told to love our neighbor as ourselves. Parents can defraud their children by not giving them guidance. They don't give them instruction. They don't give them love. They just get busy with their own lives. And you can defraud your children that way. You're stealing something from them that rightfully belongs to them. We need to give them that love and affection. Another way people steal, and this one here is in Malachi chapter 3, we can steal from God. Will a man rob God? God says, yet you have robbed me. You say, where are we robbed? You've robbed me in tithes and offerings. We can steal from God. When you withhold what is rightfully God's, you have stolen from him. And I know a lot of people, when they give, and I'm not talking necessarily about our church, but this is, this is common in a lot of churches. You know, uh, people go out and make an income, and, and they'll, it used to be they you know, kind of whip out the $50 bill, put it in the offering plate, and they're thinking they're okay. Now they might whip out the 100 put it in the offering plate, thinking they're okay. But is that your tithe and your offering? Is that 10%? That's a tithe. Is that your tithe of what you made? And, and you young people, you get a birthday gift, $20 birthday gift. Are you tithing? If not, you're stealing from God. And we need to teach our children that principle. They must learn to tithe at an early age. It's not because God needs your money. It's because God is trying to teach us something that's tied into stealing. And that is what we're going to get to in just a moment. And that's about giving. We ought to be givers, not takers. So honesty is very, very important. That's why Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more. We ought to be above reproach when it comes to living the Christian life. Now, let's look here at the second part of that verse, Ephesians 4, 28. 
It says, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. So this leads us to the next thing. We ought to work. What's the best way to fix a thief? Put them to work. Why? Because they will learn the value of things. You have kids that say, uh, I want this. They go to the store. I, want, I like that. I want that. Buy that for me. Buy that for me. They'll stop that in a hurry when you make them work for their money. They'll learn the value of a dollar quickly. So we need to make sure that we teach young people and we ourselves learn to work. Work fulfills us. Work is a blessing, but our flesh hates it. Our flesh fights against it. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says if we don't work, neither should we. Your kid won't clean their room, there's an easy fix. Okay, no food for you until that room's clean. You watch when they get hungry how fast that room gets clean. I'm just telling you it works. Some people say, oh, that's abuse. No, it's Bible. We have gotten too soft in our society when it comes to living these Christian principles. We must teach them. We must teach them to work. We must teach them what God requires here. God commands labor to be done on six of the seven days. Now, he does, in the New Testament, makes uh, of six of the seven days of the week, we ought to have a time where we rest, a time where we can think about God and we worship him. But there are things that Jesus had mentioned there in the New Testament, talks about the ox being in the ditch, talks about sometimes priority. There are things that need to get done that can't get done any other time. That's where you need to make sure that what you're doing uh, is in agreement with God. The old rabbis used to teach this, and I thought this was really interesting. He who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. That's pretty good. Trades are important to learn. Trades are important to learn. Matter of fact, when I first started out in the ministry, that was one thing I thought, you know, our Bible colleges, they teach about Bible, they teach how to get a sermon, they teach other things. They don't really teach you a lot of times practical things you're going to get in the ministry. But you know what would have been more helpful? If they, if they were to talk preachers a trade. Because so many preachers out there go to smaller churches or assistant pastors go to a church uh, or youth pastors go to a church and they can't earn a full salary at the church. So they need to have a trade, something to fall back on. And oftentimes they don't because they don't know how to do anything. There's been a lot of preachers' hands that I've shaken hands with and they are the softest hands of anybody you've ever come across. That's terrible. Should not be that way. A preacher ought to know how to work. They ought to know how to put some labor in. Not a thing wrong with that. So we ought to learn to do a trade. Ought to learn to do something with our hands. The Bible teaches us in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. I'm not going to read that, but it actually says this in verse 19. It says work. Talk about work. Work is a gift of God. Laboring with our hands, that's a gift of God. We ought to teach our kids how to work with school, their schoolwork. They ought to be good in school. Now, not every kid is an A student, but if the best they can do is a C, they ought to be the best C student there. They ought to put forth their best effort. We ought to teach them when it comes to music lessons, help them, teach them how to be faithful. When it comes to chores, when it comes to doing odd jobs, have them work for the neighbor. Have them do things for them. And even if they don't make a fair wage with it, we need to make sure that we are teaching them to work. Sometimes senior citizens, they've been in church for a long time, they've taught Sunday school, they've worked hard, they've been that 10% crowd that gets 90% of the work done in church for years, and then they get older, and guess what? You get older, you get tired. You can't do the things you used to. I find myself, I can't, I keep trying to push myself, and I'm like, good night, why am I so tired? I just feel so strung out. Well, I'm over 50 now, okay? I'm 51. I'm going to get a little more tired than when I was 30. It gets worse. I know it does. I keep hearing that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are exhorting me. You know? <laughs> Prepare me for old age. You know? But the thing is, we don't have the energy to do the things we used to do. But here's what I hear seniors say. Well, I've served my time. Now it's time for the young people to step up. There's never a time to retire in God's work. Now, you might retire from your job. Yes, there's not a thing wrong with retiring from that. But when it comes to serving God, there's never a time until God calls you home. 
There's something God wants you to do. Find out what it is and do it. Be faithful. The Bible teaches us in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, that the opposite of work is idleness. Matter of fact, uh, let me turn back there because this verse describes, uh, this is the one I'm thinking of here, I think it's the one I picked out, describes America. Um, yes. This is why God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Now listen to this very carefully. It says here in verse 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. God expects us to work. He expects us to do stuff to uh, produce for society. Today, society has a wrong view of work. Amen. You cannot legislate the poor into freedom. It doesn't work. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I'm talking about giving a $15 an hour minimum wage. You can't legislate them into freedom. All of a sudden, that $15 an hour wage is going to help them. Guess what's going to happen? Somebody's got to pay that $15 an hour wage. It's the employer. They've got to get the money from somewhere. Guess how they're going to get it? From the customer. So that $15 an hour wage that just got increased did nothing for the person getting it. Because what they used to get for $4, now it's going to cost them $12. Everything just keeps going up. You guys who are older, I remember back when the minimum wage, I think, I'm trying to remember what it was when I got my first job, I was in high school. I think it was three eighty-five an hour was minimum wage. Do you realize if the wages always stayed the same, the cost of things really wouldn't go up very much at all. But the cost of living keeps going up. Why? Because we keep trying to legislate this thing about work and we're trying to set people free by increasing their wage. Did you realize the minimum wage was there for a reason? It was not there for people to stay on minimum wage their entire life. It was a starting point. That's what it was for. And if you didn't like it, guess what you were supposed to do? Work and prove yourself to get off the minimum wage. That's the way God set it up. That's the way when he set up the government. That's what it was there for. Here's another thing about uh, how the society has a wrong view of work. You can't multiply wealth by dividing it. What do they want to do? They're wanting to take all this wealth and divide it. Give free handouts to people who went to college and they decided to rack up a fortune and they have a million dollars in debt now. So let's just pay it off for them. You're dividing it. Someone has to pay for it. That's called socialism. It doesn't work. It has never worked in this world. There's not one case anywhere socialism has ever worked. It will not work. It cannot work. You know why? Because one thing socialism does not take into account is man's sinful nature. It never takes that into account. People are selfish. They're going to get what they can from it. Government can't give to someone something that it doesn't first take from someone else. When someone receives something without working for it, someone else had to work for it without receiving it. Many people's goals today are only to work to get enough money so they don't have to work. It's not the way to go. It. It's great, like I said, if you can work and then retire from your job, but the worst thing you can do is sit around and do nothing. That's when you're going to die. Hurt. Why? Because God made us to work. In the sweat of our brow, we are to work. We are to learn to do some things. So we need to teach others to work. And then this leads us to the third thing here. It says, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. Why? That he may have to give to him that needed. You know, every one of us in life are going to have a time when we're needed. We're going to have a need. And it's okay to receive graciously just like we would give graciously. Because you're going to be on the receiving end at one time, but you also, God wants you to be on the giving end at one time. So we ought to learn to be givers. The opposite of stealing is giving. And that's what work does. It brings all that around. We must work to meet our needs, but also we must work to help meet the needs of others. Now let me say that. Say this about that. We are not working to meet their wants. It's their needs. 
If they have a need, let's meet it. Let's help it out. Let's do what we can for these things. Acts chapter 20 talks about uh, this giving and the purpose of it. Let me just flip over there and read this, and this will be where I finish up here. Acts 20 and verse 33. It says, Paul speaking here says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessity. He's saying, work with your hands. And to them that were with me, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to what? Yeah. To give than receive. We see this in our own kids. We've done this since uh, they were little. We would give each of them twenty dollars. They would go out and buy birth or birthday gifts, Christmas gifts for everybody else. Now, you do the math, and when they're buying gifts for mom, dad, and then all the brothers and sisters, twenty dollars isn't going a long way in our household. Yeah, but that's what we do. We just give them something because we want them to learn to give. But you know what? It, this is the thing that's so exciting. Since they were little, they've done this. Whenever it comes time for Christmas. They were always excited, more excited seeing somebody else open their gift than they were getting their own gift and opening it up. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than receive. You see, it's teaching them principles. And it's something that we need to make sure that we ourselves get. Giving frees us from selfishness. It frees us from misery. We can give more than just money. Here's something we ought to give one another. Understanding. Have an understanding heart. Everybody doesn't think like us. Everybody doesn't act like us. Everybody doesn't go through the same thing. So let's give some understanding to one another. Let's get acceptance. You young people, don't be a bully and don't be a brat to others. Give some acceptance. Realize the new kid that's coming to church doesn't know anybody. Why don't you befriend them? The new people that come through the door, well, they don't know you. You don't know them. Introduce yourself to them. Give acceptance. We can also give forgiveness. That's a big one. Because we all get offended. Give forgiveness. John Wesley once said this. He says, make all you can to save all you can in order to give all you can. That's a pretty good principle to live by. It covers all of these things. The best thing, though, that we can give of anything we can give is to give our life to the Lord. That's the best thing we can give. Satan wants to steal from you the abundant life that God wants to give you through work. He wants to bless you. Satan wants to steal those things from you. You know something that kids, they, they have to learn this the hard way. When they do a job, they might struggle, they might uh, you know, toil through, but when they do a job and they do it well, there's some satisfaction that comes from that. And when you're an adult and you've done the same thing, there's something you've worked hard at and you've accomplished, there's some satisfaction. Why? Because that's the way God made us. He made it to be a blessing. And all this joy that God wants for us, he want, it starts with salvation. We need to make sure that we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. But let him that stole steal no more. Stealing is an epidemic in our country. It's an epidemic everywhere in the world. It's sad that it's that way. And people that you never thought would even, I mean, you look at them like, they're shoplifting? Yeah. And here's their excuse. Well, everybody else is doing it. Doesn't make it right. Still stealing. Let him that stole steal no more. What do you need to do? You need to learn to work with your hands. Why? As you work with your hands and you're diligent about your work, then you have to give to others. That's the way God set up. That's how he wants us to deal with that commandment about neither shout out to you. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, and I pray that you help us to teach these important principles to young people. But Lord, help us to have it in our households. Help us to have it in our church. Help us to do what we can. We can't always do the things maybe we used to do, but we can do something. And Lord, help us to do those things and just be faithful at it. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for uh, the gifts, the talents, and abilities that you've given to us. And Lord, help us to make sure that it's not just possessions we're talking about with stealing, but this thing about defrauding or withholding affection, that's something that does belong to somebody else. Help us to realize these are just as serious as taking somebody's possession. And Father, I pray that 
uh, as we go throughout the next week and the next month or so, that, Lord, you'll bring this back to our mind, that we might be honest, that we might be a worker, so that we might be a giver. And, Father, we ask these things now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, as we sing a song of invitation, 200.